Hello again. So this is the third video in my little mini-series on cryptographic hash functions and the implications, uh, the applications of those techniques in things like SSL certificates, um, blockchain, Bitcoin, and all that stuff that I'll move on to in a later video. So the, the video number three is all about digital signatures, which is a very key concept that builds on the first two videos. Um, so the first video was about public keys, the second video was about introducing cryptographic hash functions. Um, both quite simple, elegant mathematical concepts, um, but please watch those two videos if you're not familiar with those concepts, because otherwise this video won't make a lot of sense. I'm going to try and keep this one even shorter than the last one. I do tend to ramble on a bit sometimes, but I, again, I am very eager to make sure that anybody from a, a, any background um, doesn't have to be technical can, can actually understand this stuff. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I will try and get back with answers very quickly. Um, so digital signatures, um, the as, as I mentioned, um, these are key in applications to do with uh, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, um, SSL certificates and all manner of other things. And, and to be honest, in this day and age, I find it incredible that that we still sign pieces of paper with a pen and, and somehow the law of the land and the, and the police and the army uh, effectively, um, are all basically behind in terms of the eyes of the law on, on a squiggle of ink on a piece of paper. Digital signatures are, I think they are here to stay, um, they're growing in their usage massively um, and this will explain how they work. So I'm just going to give a quick review of where we got so far um, of the hash functions in the, in the public private key. Um, so a hash function, take any digital asset, uh, it could be a, uh, an mp3 file, a dvd, it could be a small text file, um, an email, whatever, um, you pass it through one of these, uh, in one of these hashing algorithms, and the, the one that I like to talk about mostly is SHA-256, although it doesn't really matter which one you're talking about. Um, and what happens is, out the other end of this algorithm pops out a 256-bit it's called a digest. That's your um, that's your hash value, um, and if you want to represent that with letters and numbers, you, you can do so, and and you can do so in a much more compact, readable form. Um, the key thing is that any two any two files that you hash, uh, be it an MP3, two MP3s, JPEGs, whatever, will never theoretically generate the same hash value, and if you change so much as a single bit or character or any aspect of these digital inputs at all, the hash value will be completely different. So sorry to go over that um, if you've already been over the video um, number two. But uh, the, the other one, now I'm not going to go over the, the asymmetric encryption all over again because that, that's even more long-winded. But um, what I do want to do is to draw a slight distinction or at least a slight modification to the, exa the example in the first video of the asymmetric chest. If you remember in the first video, the asymmetric chest was actually a, um, a chest where you used the, the, the public key to lock the chest and the private key to unlock the chest. Now, that's a slight over, oversimplification. Um, the, I'm gonna actually make a, a, a modification that we need to do for, for um, the actual uh, digital signatures, which is to to modify the chest in such a way that you can lock it with either key, but you have to use the other key to unlock it. Right? It's pretty straightforward. So you don't always use the public key to lock the chest and the private key to unlock the chest. But if you lock the key with the private chest, the, if you lock the chest with the private key, my apologies, um, then you must unlock it with the public key. Right. So it's it's still an asymmetric chest, and I've just um, denoted that with a, a sort of a a, you know, a combo uh, lock. So um, hopefully that's not too 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 much of an extension um, to what we talked about in the first video. And it doesn't invalidate what we said in the first video. Let's just say it's a different uh, a different type of uh, chest. Um, the RSA encryption algorithm, which which is used and which we mentioned in the first video extensively, works in such a way that that you can use the public or the private key to to do the encryption or or decryption. It's just that um, often the public key is used to encrypt and the private key is used to decrypt. But anyway, so hopefully that's uh, that's not too confusing. So 
what's a signature? So if we used to we are very used to the concept of signatures in in real life. Um, we, for example, if Humpty Dumpty um, remember this guy from our first video. Let's say he wants to pay um, the gingerbread man for some uh, services rendered, um, uh, and he wants to pay him two hundred pounds. So he'll write a check like this, present it to uh, the gingerbread man. He will then go and cash it in at the, the, the bank. So Humpty, what does he do? So until Humpty's signed this check, obviously the uh, the gingerbread man will not be able to cash this check. So Humpty puts pen to paper, puts a squiggle, including the amount. But the thing about checks, as we all know, is that if you, if you modify, um, if, if the gingerbread man were to try and cross this out and then replace the number with uh, 500 pounds here, um, then the bank would not accept the check. Okay. So that's a signature in the real world. Now, um, in 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 the the virtual world, uh, it's, it's a very similar concept. Or so let's say the digital world, not the virtual world. So um, if I have a if I have a let's say a, a digital asset, um, let's say it could be um, a contract document, right? Now, what so what we can do is we can basically just um, we can just feed this document into one of these SHA-256 hash functions, right? And out the other side comes out your scrambled up hash, which is 256 bits, as we know, and, and that's the unique representation of the, of, of the, of the document. And it's impossible to go back from the hash to recover the document, but no two documents will give you the same hash. I've been over this a uh, hundred times, so you probably hear, sick of me hearing me say it. So first of all, this is the first step. You take the document, put it through the hash function, and you would record this uh, this hash down here. Sorry, I don't need to cross that out. Um, now, so F3AB. Then what you would do is you would take take this hash, and then Humpty, because Humpty is the one sending the document, he will use his private key to encrypt the hash value. Right. So effectively, what he's doing is it, it, going back to the first video. He's locking that, locking that hash up in one of these asymmetric chests. Right. But he's using his private key to lock the chest. Right. Now that locked chest, if effectively is your digital signature, right? And let's say that the, so the encrypted hash code using the private key comes out as CC15, G23, etc. It's still the same length as the original hash, but it's been encrypted using the private key, right? So it's 256 bits or 64 hex characters, if, if you want to represent the number like that, okay? So, so what, what does this dig digital signature actually do, right? So on the next slide, Basically, we can see here, we've got a basic, the representation of a digital signature is the original document, right, which does not include the digital signature, and it includes, a, well, appended to the document, we've got these other components. First of all, we have the, the digital signature from the previous slide, and then we also have to send the, the public key right, to the recipient. So the recipient basically gets all this. Now, if you were sending this, you probably would want to send, for example, this this part separately to the original document, so that the chances of somebody in the middle getting hold of all of this and and doing something and basically creating their own signature and modifying the document would be far less. So, um, but that conceptually is a digitally signed document. Now. Once Gingerbread Man down here receives all this, what does he actually do with it, right? So here he is. So we've got we've, he's pieced all this back together. So he's got this signed this signed document here, right? Now, first thing he does is he says, right, take this, take the public key, right? So he's got that he's got that one there. Take the public key and decrypt the the signature from here, right? So when he decrypts the signature, 
using the RSA algorithm, lo and behold, out comes this hash. Right. So don't, if you just if you remember, first of all, we we hash the document. Then we encrypted the hash using RSA to give us the digital signature. So when we decrypt the digital signature with, with the public key, we get the original hash. Now the last thing that Gingerbread Man is going to do is he's going to take the original document, which does not include the signature, by the way, that's very important, just take that and pass it through the SHA-256 he has a let's say he has a SHA-256 uh, mincing machine at his at his side as well. Um, everybody with a computer does, and so he can check what the hash is of the original document as well. And if these two match up, then the signature is considered valid. Now, what are the implications of this? There's, there are, there are two implications. First of all. The, the document that was received has not been changed in any way, right? And if we go back to the previous slide, if a single letter, or let's say this was a contract, and if one single space had been added, you know, within that document, the hash that the gingerbread man does on the received document would be, would be completely different. It would be something like 8BFQ. At that point, it would not match the signature from the, the decrypted um, it would not match the, the hash from the decrypted signature and therefore this would no longer be valid. So the second implication is that only the owner of the private key that corresponds to the received public key can have signed it, right? So if you go back to this slide again, so the the way this treasure chest works is that um, the the if I can unlock this treasure chest with the public key that I've been provided, then that means that it must have been locked by the the private key belonging to the same person who sent me the public key. All right now, what are the challenges? Of this, and this is this is this will lead us into the next uh, into the next uh, video. Okay, so what are the challenges? The challenges, the main challenge, actually, is that how do we know? How does Gingerbread Man know? Because Humpty says, "Okay, I'm going to send you this document. It's been signed by me. I'll send you my public key, so so you can decrypt it." But how does Gingerbread Man know that the public key that he's received? actually belongs to Humpty Dumpty. And that's that's a challenge because um, what can happen is that, as I alluded to before, somebody can actually intercept this and then insert, basically use his own public key and send it on to the eventual destination. I'll go into more details on that in the next video. I'm going to basically do a specific video on man in the middle attacks um, but that is uh, yeah you might remember this fellow from the from the first video um, so he's going to play a, a big role in, in in the next part so I think that was hopefully a bit quicker um, I uh, any questions as usual please leave them down below I'll get back to them as quickly as I can um, if you have any feedback on you know how you'd like me to do these videos better uh, feel free to leave that feedback as well and I'll try and incorporate it next time so thank you for watching and uh, see you in the next one.